Welcome to the European Students' Convention 36 here in Vienna. It is my honor to greet you all in the name of the Österreichische Hochschülerinnenschaft here in the beautiful House of Music in the city of Vienna. Four months ago, Sebastian Berger, who is now at the Executive Committee of the European Students' Union, approached me and asked me if I would want to take over for this event. Sebastian, it's over there. <laughs> I thought first, oh, are you sure? That's not much time and a pretty big event. And he was trusting me that I would make this event a memorable experience for all of you. So thank you for that uh, trust. I really worked a lot the last weeks, I learned a lot, and I'm looking forward to the next few days with you. Let us start with our first guest, who came directly from his office in Brussels, the president of the European Students' Union, Adam Gajek. Please welcome on stage. Great, thank you Ricardo very much for welcoming. I think we all talk to Sebastian quite often. Uh, <laughs> I always encourage also that this event is going to be amazing. So um, as far as so, so thank you very much. Anyway, dear minister, dear board members, dear organizers, dear hacks, dear guests, and dear everybody. It's my absolute pleasure to speak here today as a first, as first speaker, but also it's the first time I have a pleasure to speak to the board as the president of ASU. First time I'm also here with our whole team, uh, which was elected by our board in May, but also which uh, gained some other people in the team later in June, where we selected three very talented coordinators. So in the very beginning of this event and speech, I wanted to ask the whole Hacks team to stand up and wave so everybody sees you. So all the Hacks, you know, Hacks who you are. So these are the, these are, yeah, long, yeah. So, so these are the people who work for you for already three months, and I think the last three months we had were quite exhausting. Uh, so we are not here to, uh, to, to relax, but to continue working for you, and I hope uh, you also find it as successful and as committed as we are, because I think we are all able to proudly say that we are doing a good job. Anyway, yesterday we had something what always have to happen before any uh, SO event. We had EC meeting and it, when you saw yesterday in the evening quite grumpy faces of Hacks team, is yeah, because of that it was eight hours of discussing, also including standing orders, so I think you can imagine. And uh, one of the topics we discussed yesterday was SO's commitment to the Bologna process. Because here in Vienna, just after the ESC, um, Bologna follow-up group meeting is going to be held and ESU is going to advocate there for our policies. And we discuss what is going to be the ESU's role, this ESU plays in this, uh, in this uh, working groups for the next years. And we all understood over our discussions that our role there is also a huge responsibility because there is no other stakeholder, no other body, no other organization in Bologna process, in any European politics like ESSO, which always advocates on students' behalf, on learners' behalf, and this is a great responsibility we all bear. But each time we, as ESSO representative, are able to raise a voice on behalf of the organization, I think we all understand that the only reason and the only possibility that we are here, we are there, is because of years of, years of fights that generations of students' movement activists has done to ensure that education is understood as a public responsibility and also as a public good. Thanks to that we are able to, to be here to discuss all of those topics here and we are also able to promote them in the Bologna process in the EU in the capacity building everywhere where our unions wants us to, to spread it. So we all know that nothing can be done without education and our societies wouldn't do much without it. And we are all, I'm very happy and I think we are all very happy that most of, or everybody in this room really accepts and supports this statement. 
But there are so many other people we have to convince. And this is also a very important thing with connect, which connects us all, that we, our work, all of us, all of student representatives, is to convince other stakeholders, other decision makers, other people, that education is a public good and is a public responsibility. And I'm very happy that I don't have to convince you over this event, but we can discuss how we can convince other people. And I think that this is also a very important message we should spread around, that we all students believe that this is the main purpose of education, to be and serve the society and to be and to belong to everybody. Thanks to OHA, we are able to discuss it here. So every union is able to choose a topic of a convention, of a seminar. You have decided <clears throat> to discuss the role of education in our societies. Thank you, Aha, very much for this, because there's a very important topic and we haven't discussed it for a very long time. So I want to wish all of us lots of important and lots of fruitful discussions on all of those topics. I'm sure other all workshops, we're going to have a chance for this, over all evening activities, we are going to have a chance to follow up on our discussions. Thank you, Iha, for organizing this lovely event in all of, all of your work you put in here, because as Ricardo said, you were nicely surprised by Sebastian to organize this event. This is what always happened in ESSO, that you're nicely surprised to take up some job you didn't expect to, but this is how students' organization work. Always a lot of pressure, always lots of surprises, but always very successful and very, very motivating work. So thank you, have very much, and I wish you all a very, very good event. See you around. Thank you, Adam. We are really looking forward to the many workshops from you and your colleagues these days. Our next guest promised us its support very early in the beginning already. Please welcome with me the Minister of Education, Science and Research, Bundesminister Heinz Fassmann. Yes, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of the European Student Convention, welcome here in Vienna. I'm really pleased that the Austrian National Union of Students and the European Student Association have been invited to the 36th European Student Convention here in Austria. This fits very well in the Austrian presidency um, and Vienna is maybe for half a year the capital of all European discussions around research and education in the tertiary sector. I have gathered from your website that the focus will be on higher education as a public good. You emphasized it and the public responsibility. You will emphasize its benefits and its influence on students as part of the European society and as people responsible for the further political development in Europe. You will illustrate the growing importance of the tertiary system Research and development, development are the driving forces of an economic system which constantly requires new innovations in order to compete and to solve ecological, social, demographic um, and economic problems. I follow completely your argumentation um, as, well, um, as well as when you emphasize that there is an increasing importance of the social group of students in our population. Um, we have now around, nobody really knows, it depends on how you count, around 300,000 students. And this is much more than, let's say, 20 years or 30 years um, ago. Um, in the, the OECD revised definition of tertiary education says that 40% <coughs> of the 25 to, 30, 25 to 34 years old population do have something like a tertiary education. That's a very charming definition for Austria, 40%, because they include um, the vocational training to some extent. Meisterschulen are within that number. Um, 
um, if you exclude this vocational training, then you have around half of that number, around 20% of that age group who has some academic university or applied science university um, gradation. Subsequently, you formulate um, the growing public sector responsibility for tertiary education. And once again, I agree. Austria has not gone down the path to, of transferring the Austrian higher education system to a private sector. Okay? Um, quite the contrary is true. Uh, higher education is a public good and the public sector invests a lot in that area. Austria has not cut spending as other European um, countries have, but increased it. Um, and for the majority of students, there is no need to pay tuition fees. I do not expect gratitude <laughs> as such, but a fair acknowledge, acknowledge of that typical Austrian way. Um, throughout the last and recent university funding, the universities will receive um, for three years 11 billion euro, which is a really significant number for a small country. And there is an increase of 1.3 billion um, for the next three years. So the universities are able to employ more professors and they can ensure a better student-teacher ratio and I hope that they can guarantee and enable a shorter study durations. Um, if I compare Austria to other European countries, Austria has a 1.6% expenditure rating of the GDP um, of public tertiary education and this is significant higher than the 1.1 percent of all other EU or OECD countries. Last week we celebrated um, not only the start of construction work of the so-called four clinic in the Mariannengasse. You are too short here in Vienna to know that this is a large area in the ninth district um, and a really, let's say, a prominent address to build a new four clinic um, for our medical university. We also opened the construction of the um, Biology Centrum, Biology Center in the third district, quite near the cluster of our life sciences. Um, all in all, our ministry invests around of 600 million euro in projects which are going on only in Vienna in the next years. And all these projects um, should guarantee modern, ecologically sustainable and student-friendly infrastructure. So there are clear signs of public responsibility. If I <clears throat> should summarize and bring it to the point, yes, higher education is a public good, especially in a high-tech country like Austria. And Austria is a really high-tech paying country. If you earn a little bit above the average, you pay 50% of your income as taxes. So um, we want to be, to be able to educate the next generation, that's clear, financed as a public responsibility to give them the necessary tools for a self-determined and successful life. Yes, we want to improve the conditions to study. We want to increase the number of what we call active students. Active students means they do some examinations during a year with a certain threshold. And we want to increase the chance for students that they can finish their study program within the given time which is set in the curricula. Um, 
Yes, we also need more information about studying. That's my personal wish. Um, this is not really, this does not really belong to, to public responsibility. But this is my personal wish that students are choosing the study program um, which they really want. Uh, and therefore, we have a lot of things to do and we are happy that there is a cooperation between the Ministry and the Österreichische Hochschülerschaft. Studieren, probieren, try to study, which is, I think, a very su successful um, um, program to sh show our secondary students, our students in the gymnasium and in the Berufsbildende Höhere Schulen, which large array of study programs are taught in Austrian universities. Um, there are a lot of possibilities for the students um, and we should avoid to some extent the concentration of the seven or eight, what we call sometimes misleading um, Massenfächer, mass subjects. Um, and these mass subjects could be avoided if there is a larger information about the plenty of study programs. <coughs> And if it is sometimes possible that a student from Vienna choose Klagenfurt as a place to study, um, or Linz, um, that would be a contribution to, how I can say, to, to decrease the problems which we had here in Vienna on the housing market um, or in the universities. So I think we have to make arrangements also on how we should take the social dimension into account. Universities are not community colleges, are not Volkshochschulen on the one hand. On the other hand, they are also not place of elitism. Um, we want those to find a place because of their talents and not of their income. Hence, the study grants was increased. No gratitude. The study um, grants was increased last winter from 60 million to around, the numbers are right, from 60 million to around 250 million per year. From 200 to 250, yes, that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be too low the times before. So, this is, a, I think, a considerable sum and a considerable increase. Accordingly, we expect, we have now the, 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 pr the process of what we call target negotiations, Leistungsvereinbarungsverhandlungen. That's the German. They are making longer, longer words. Target negotiations, Leistungsvereinbarungsverhandlungen. And we ask in the universities um, projects, um, which projects do you plan to increase um, the social dimension or to increase the diversity of the student's population. What do you do to bring students, let's say, with migration background um, um, into the university? So there is another um, active effort from our ministry to ask this, the, to the universities to do something. So on the other hand, sometimes I would say, but we need also students which takes this, the, the, which takes uh, studying as a serious job. You know, I was a professor for many years, <laughs> and I can say that I can judge and estimate student behavior to some extent. I remember very well, I presented a lecture, Introduction into Spatial Planning, Einführung in die Raumordnung. Um, that was a great lecture, very important issue. Raumordnung is maybe the most important issue um, of all these different disciplines. Um, the first, on the first event, 300 students are following to me. Um, the next time, <laughs> 100 and the over next time, 50. But I was always, most of the time, well prepared and if I if, if I like to do it, I can it. I bring, um, I bring the content of a lecture in a, in, a, in a charming, amusing way to the students. 
The only disadvantage was my lecture was at Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so I, I have fully understanding. <laughs> Um, nevertheless, I would ask for students which are taking studying as a main profession. Um, this is a, a wish from, from my side. Let me conclude in the following way. To Felix Austria, um, happy, glückliches Österreich, happy Austria. Um, this is a country which maintains the balance between social care, public responsibility, and personal responsibility. So, um, I'm coming from Germany. I can expect and judge this is a specific Austrian way of living, negotiating, finding a consensus, and finding a balance. And I prefer this Austrian way. I'm sorry um, for it. I look forward to your ideas for developing the higher education systems furthermore. Um, I cannot attend the whole time. Please excuse me, but the results will reach me in one form or another. Have a great conference ahead, fruitful discussions, all the best. Enjoy Vienna, but I'm sure you will do it. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Bundesminister Heinz Fassmann. <clears throat> thank you also for, uh, to the Ministry for funding the catering that we will have later at lunch <laughs> after uh, the keynote speech of Martin Unger. Our next guests are three, but unfortunately only two, uh, women who are really looking forward to this event. Uh, I'm talking about the three chairwomen of the Österreichische Hochschülerinnenschaft, who are presenting the Österreichische Hochschülerinnenschaft in a very perfect way. And uh, unfortunately, Johanna Gasteiger can't be here today because she's uh, not, Zeichmeister will not be here because she's uh, not feeling too well. So please join me on stage, Marita Gasteiger and Hanna Lutz from the Fossets. So, um, hi from our side as well. I'm very happy to see you here and even though we don't owe any gratitude to being able to study for free because it is a public good, um, I am very grateful to um, be here today to say hi um, to the Minister and um, thank you for coming again. Um, thank you for the amazing team that got all this running in just a couple of um, months. Thank you to Ricardo, Liam, and um, Sasha. You did an amazing job, and I think... Yeah. Everyone's gonna see what kind of amazing job you did, and I'm really sorry I'm not texting or anything. I, was just, I just wasn't able to print out what I wanted to say because printers and me, we don't really get along too good. Um, thank you to Adam, Katrina and Robert. Um, I think we're going to have an amazing time together and we're very happy to being able to do this in Vienna. Um, I think many unions are facing um, being forced into dependencies, being forced to give up their independency, to rely on other people. I think it's really important that across Europe, we as students, we as student representatives know who we have to answer to. And who we have to answer to are only the students for who we work, not anyone else, and that is a really important fact to behold. It's important that we're financially independent, it's important that we're politically independent, that's the only way that we can actually work, and that's the only way we can represent those who need it, the students of our countries at home. It makes us extremely happy to have lots of you here because at the end of the day we're going to go home with lots of new ideas, we're going to compare systems, we're going to see which things work for us, which things work for you, what we can learn from each other and I think for that, well, I'm very thankful and it's an amazing opportunity. Um, for children whose parents didn't go to university, who, didn't, um, who don't come from this academic background, it can often be very hard. 
So this is where we come in, this is where the ministry has to come in, this is where universities have to come in. This is where we need to help, this is where we need to show people what they can actually achieve, and only with that we can achieve our goals, that that public, public responsibility that we have, that the education as a public good can really get to, um, get to everyone. We, and the minister has already mentioned it, have um, a little thing called Studium Provieren, so um, students um, take kids from school and show them lectures, they talk to them beforehand, um, they watch the lecture together, students can ask them questions later, what was the subject, um, and not only what the professor was actually talking about, but how much do I have to work here, where do I get the books, um, what's student life like? And um, that's the thing that really helps, especially students whose parents didn't go to university, to actually understand and cope with um, a sort of new world they're thrown into. Another thing that is very special for Austria um, is that lots of students work next to their studies. So we have lots of students who don't just go to university, but also have a job and work up to 20, 30 hours a week. So these students um, do come to university with different troubles than others because, of course, they can't um, focus on their studies as much as others can. So this is where we come in again to help, to find ways um, we can make study and work easier together because people who work, and mostly it's about 20 hours a week in Austria, of course they have more troubles actually combining both things. So this is why it's really important to have student representatives who actually help out, who do the same, who know what they're going through, um, and yeah, who can help them out at the end of the day. We have, um, or up to this semester, we had rules that students who work next to their studies don't have to pay tuition fees. This exemption has fallen now, but we can see that different universities um, like that rule so much that they're trying to implement it on by themselves because they see what students can give to them. They see that if um, we keep our students and if we don't force them out of university, at the end of the day, we're all better for it. Um, so, now my phone again. <laughs> um, in our... Um, I'm very happy that we in Austria have the um, have it that good as good as we have because we can um, sort of help students very autom um, automatically and we um, get uh, we get paid f um, without having to answer to anyone, which is a great thing. And um, representation does is, can only work if it doesn't have to fear consequences. Representation can only work if it can work independently. And this is a great thing for us that we can do that. Um, this is a great thing about our system, which helps us, which helps students, and it really helps us to work together with other people. And that's why I'm very thankful for um, uh, the ministry for being here, to talking with us, to hearing us, and to actually taking things that we say and implementing them. Of course, not everything, but I guess that's just life. Um, and yeah, with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to Marita. Dear colleagues, a warm welcome here in Vienna from my side too. Thank you all for coming here and I really hope that you will be enjoying your stay here in the beautiful city of Vienna. We are looking forward to the upcoming days full of discussions, full of inspiration and full of exchange. Nevertheless, especially in these days, in these times, we cannot host such an event without talking about current political changes in Europe and in Austria as well. We are witnessing times of growing populism, of increasing right-wing extremism, when times when demanding to concentrate refugees in certain places does not have any consequences. Times when academics, students and scientists are witnessing pressure, censorship, and uh, even persecution because of their research. We are witnessing times when banning scientific disciplines from universities is seen as an achievement. Times when women get death and rape threats when they dare to say or to write their opinion. Austria is no exception in all of this. And of course there are political players responsible for that. 
But still, this all affects us as students' representatives, as students, and simply as citizens. Violence, harassment, anti-democratic tendencies, we cannot just close our eyes. What about, you know, our responsibilities? We do not really want to test how far those tendencies can go in the end. We have the high privilege to get further knowledge about nearly everything we want to. This contains, of course, a certain responsibility. If we notice discrimination, it is our job to tackle it. If we notice injustice, it is our job to fight it. If we notice mistakes in our educational system, then it's our job to put it on the agenda. If we notice exclusion or barriers in our system or in higher education, then it's our job to make the system more inclusive. If we notice racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, or any homophobia or any other kind of ideology of inequality in our society, then it's our job to change it, or at least to try it. Isn't this why we all are part of this whole thing? We want to change something to the better? I am deeply convinced that without our contribution, without our engagement, without our expertise, there is not just something missing, but there is a real danger that the situation in Europe reaches its point of no return, as it happened already in some countries. Let's take this responsibility seriously for future generations and for the future of all of us. I am sure that we can do this and I am sure that we are not alone in this thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Marita. Thank you also for your support for this whole event. We really rely on you. Um, before the keynote speech, we have a few announcements to make. Some by me and some by our trusted persons, Nadi and Joao. I would say we first welcome Joao and Nadi on stage to make some uh, announcement and to read the statements of the Code of Conduct. Please welcome me on stage. Dear Board, according to ESU's Code of Conduct, ESU events are a discrimination-free area. Therefore, all disrespectful and inappropriate behavior, sexist jokes or sexual harassment is unacceptable and any violation of this will be taken seriously. At SU events, we have a diverse group of people with different backgrounds, and we should be able to ensure an atmosphere of respect, tolerance, and cooperation. If you witness or feel discriminative behavior of any kind, pl please turn yourself to Marie or me, and the contacts will be shared to you on board mail, or just approach us directly. We are the Code of Conduct Trusted Persons during this ESE. Know that all contact with the trusted persons is treated with confidentiality and discussion, but that the current code of conduct procedure is not compati compatible with anonymous complaints. Please feel able to contact the trusted persons privately through Facebook, email, phone or text, and understand that reports and complaints will be treated with sensitivity. So all we have to say is have a great event, and hopefully we are not uh, called about this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, the workshops today, tomorrow and the day after will all take place at the Technical University of Vienna. It is reachable from here by foot. We have uh, people from ÖH guiding you there later. And I hope you all already signed in the lists with the names of the workshops. Please be on time. Uh, just so we can have the workshops in time and not have any delay for the other ones. And uh, yes, uh, there's nothing to add to what Marie and Joao said. 
So we will have a pause now until 10.30, that's uh, approximately 25 minutes, where you can go out, take some fresh air, and you know, stay nearby, because we will have a keynote speech at 10.30 with Martin Unger here. I'm really looking forward. Thank you.
the Eurostudent project, where we try to do the same on European level and compare the situation of students in, uh, in Europe. And because of this, I was also an Austrian delegate to the first social dimension working group in the Bologna process. This took place in already in 2004-05, and you probably only find uh, results of that group in the Bologna Museum, because it's already such a long time ago. Um, but still, the report from that group, I think, is, is uh, still very valid, and uh, not so many things have changed. I'm going um, to present you a little bit of my impressions over all this time uh, in politics, I mean in, within the Bologna process and the social dimension, and then show you some of the data uh, to compare what is, the, what is the evidence and where do we stand. First, to politics. The history of the social dimension in Bologna is at least 15 years long. Actually, it was first uh, mentioned in the 2001 Prague communique, but I'm referring here only to the last six years. Eh? And uh, the period of 2012-15, before the Yerevan communique, there was a, vo a working group on the social dimension, which was co-chaired by ESO. I think for the first time that ESO really co-chaired a working group. Um, at the same time, in that period, uh, that was nearly approaching 20 years of Bologna, there were a lot of discussions among all the countries. Um, should we change the Bologna process? Do we reach its end? Should we stop it? Um, and so there were a lot of uh, um, discussions about structural reforms for the Bologna process. And within this, in summer 2014, they made a, a small survey among the member countries, among the member states, what are the priorities for the future to Bologna process. And among all the priorities the countries reported, the social dimension, surprisingly, has been mentioned on third place. And if you look, the first is implementation of these structural reforms, which didn't exist at that time, so nobody knew what it was, actually. Um, then second was mobility, third was social dimension. So actually, social dimension was the second most important topic for the countries, because the implementation of the reforms is more a uh, procedural uh, thing. So that was quite a surprise at that time, uh, summer 2014. Then, half year later, um, that took place the Bologna Researchers Conference, end of November uh, in, in Bucharest. And some ESO people, Florian Kaiser, Maulian Liviane Wigmane, presented a paper there. Uh, and they called, they had the title, No Future for the Social Dimension, at least question mark. <laughs> Um, and this paper uh, actually gives you an excellent overview of the historic development of the social dimension in, uh, in Bologna. So I have the link here on the slides and I hope the slides get uh, distributed to you uh, later on. So if you're interested in all the history I'm skipping now, uh, you can perfectly read this in, the, in this paper from your former colleagues. And they had a diagnosis at the, at the end of the paper that there's a gap between the political promises made in the communiques they seem to be quite happy what is in the communiques, um, but there's a gap between this and the actions actually taken to fulfill these promises in the countries. So on the international level, there's quite a lot of progress in the communiques, but nothing happens in the, in the countries. So one of their recommendations was maybe we should break down the end goal, which is that the, the student population should reflect the, the population in total in, a, in each country. Uh, maybe we should break down it to smaller increments, so little steps, little milestones, instead of um, talking always about the, the end goal. So that was quite of a sad outlook at this time. So six months later, um, no future, question mark. And then, again, half a year later, there was a ministerial summit in Yerevan in 2015. And the Social Dimension Working Group, co-chaired by ESO, produced not only the, the usual report of the working group, but also introduced an international strategy for the development of the social dimension in European higher education. And they called it widening participation for equity and growth. It's also linked here. And not only they proposed that they, they had this strategy, but also guidelines on how the individual countries could reach their own strategies on national level. 
Um, and some prefer to, there was a big debate, is it a strategy, could we call it national action plan and so whatsoever, but that's just the labeling. Uh, important is the, is the content. And in Yerevan, the ministers adopted this strategy and agreed to, to develop national strategies and action plans. Uh, that's three and a half years uh, ago. So that was quite uh, a big thing. The, 2004, the first working group already recommended these kind of national strategies, but it was only a recommendation. Hardly anyone followed it. Now it's really an implemented strategy in the Bologna process, and really the ministers committed by this to, to develop these kind of strategies on um, national level. So the last three years after Yerevan, 2015 to 2018, there was no working group on the social dimension. Social dimension was treated in a huge group about implementation of all the long time decided goals of the Bologna process and um, I think that working group had so many topics to cover that they only had half a meeting to discuss about the social dimension. That was like two hours within three years or so. Uh, and then writing a report and blah blah so uh, you can add some hours for this but actually there was not much uh, happening in the Bologna process. And at the same time, only very few countries developed these national strategies or any similar document, action plans whatsoever. Uh, and only very few, when I, when I wrote this, I thought, actually, that's an exaggeration. Uh, um, uh, two, three countries had a document like this already before the year one um, conference. Austria developed a, a national strategy, two, three others moved a little bit in that direction, but uh, actually even very few countries, I think it's already an exaggeration. Um, but even worse, I think, uh, for every ministerial summit, then there's a Bologna implementation report. That's kind of stock taking. What happened during the last three years? Uh, how much progress did we make? And then they have um, certain key indicators and uh, this uh, show the countries like in a, in a traffic light with red, green, um, uh, orange lights, yellow light. Uh, what is the progress we made? But these tragedies on the, on the social dimension, they are only mentioned in the introduction of the, there's a big chapter actually on, on social dimension, on data and, and, and things like that, access to higher education, but these national strategies are only mentioned in the introduction and there's no indicator and no kind of benchmarking which country really did it and, uh, or are other countries already at least in the, in the process of developing it or so. Uh, nothing like that in the last Bologna report. So I can say the last three years, that was really a lost period for the social dimension. It was not the first lost period, but again, it was a lost period. And uh, remember the paper I mentioned before, no future of the social dimension. I debated a lot with the, with the colleagues. I thought they were too too pessimistic because now we are reaching really new step with this um, international strategy on the on the social dimension. I was quite optimistic, but they were right. Huh? The next three years, um, nearly nothing um, happened. So the big question is now: Why is there no progress? At least not on the on the level of the member states. And for the preparation of these implementation reports, the Bologna follow-up group always sends around a survey at the end of each period to the ministries uh, and collecting all the information, what did you do the last three years, uh, what is the progress and uh, so on. And when you read the answers of the countries, uh, my impression is for most countries social dimension means financial student support be it grants or loans or deduction of fees or whatsoever. And most countries refer to students with disabilities. These are the two topics that nearly every country uh, mentions and many countries do not talk about anything else uh, in the section about social dimension. But then all the countries have some kind of financial support system. You may say it's not, uh, it's not good, it's a very small, it's not enough amount of money, whatever, but they, at least they have it. Um, and all the countries have some measures to support students with disabilities. So that could lead to the, to the answer, okay, we already have the social dimension. Everything what we imagine is the social dimension we already have in our country, so there's nothing to do. It's always the others that have to do something. Um, then, 
in now my observation from the from the EU student project eh, when we when we do surveying all students in more than 30 countries in many countries the questionnaire is a big debate with the ministries all the time and there are countries that do it since the 1950s and still the questionnaire and some of the questions are big issues in the ministries and discussions and so on so in many ministries social dimension is still seen as a very critical issue for politics eh? it's a little bit of danger eh? what are the students doing there eh? and um, Sometimes I, I, I heard from some ministries, maybe it's better to stay ignorant and not knowing too much. That makes politics easier. Eh? So we call a lot of uh, out for evidence and, and, and data-driven politics and so on. But when it comes to these critical issues, maybe it's better to, to stay stupid and know nothing. Then it's easier for politics. Um, another really important thing is that actually the education policy before entering higher education. That is really relevant for the, for the social dimension in higher education. Eh? So primary schooling, secondary schooling, even kindergarten policy has a lot of impact on the, on the social dimension in higher education. Who is getting uh, access to higher education? But in many countries, the responsibility might be shared between uh, different ministries, uh, one for higher education, one for schooling. And if it's a coalition government, then maybe these uh, two ministries are even run by different parties. Uh, and if I learned one thing in politics is always in all our reports, we should better not uh, recommend anything or say anything uh, which is the responsibility of other politicians. Even in the same ministry uh, uh, we are not allowed, sometimes not allowed to say something about the, another department if they were not involved in our project or so. Eh? So it's like everybody has its own garden and we can do something in, the, in, in our own garden but not interfere in the neighbor's uh, garden and not even say hey you have to do your homework. Eh? And uh, just to give you an impression, for Austria we tried to calculate what is the impact of this pre-higher education policy. We, we estimated uh, on the way from, from birth to higher education, 87% of the students from disadvantaged backgrounds below before higher education and something like 13, 15%, that is in the last step, the transition to higher education. That is something where the universities can uh, intervene with some measures, with some actions, uh, try studying like the hard tries and, and all those things. We, we only reach here at this country uh, only 10 to 15 percent of those we are, we are losing we, we could reach in the last uh, step. But 85 percent we are losing earlier on. Uh, and that is a big problem. And this has already uh, found its way in all the Bologna papers uh, that we have to take the schools on board. But how? Uh, I think uh, nothing happened uh, there so far. And then when you look back to the last 10, 15 years, there were always other political pro um, priorities. Eh? Uh, first, especially in Eastern Europe, the searing of the huge, huge expansion of the systems after 1990, eh? doubling, tripling, uh, quadrupling the number of students. Then we had the financial crisis 10 years ago, which caused big troubles in a lot of countries. Uh, unemployment, youth unemployment rose, but also unemployment of graduates rose, so that's why employability had a, um, um, made a, made a uh, move on the top um, priorities. The demographical changes, again, especially in Eastern Europe, with decline of uh, the number of um, young people, so now a decline of, of student numbers. And now uh, the most recent thing, especially again in, in, in Western Europe, the discussion about the lack of talents. Huh? So there were always other big issues, uh, so no need to tackle the social dimension uh, really. And then maybe one of the most important issues, there are no short-term benefits, at least not for politics. If you really implement something, uh, and uh, maybe you should start in kindergarten already, so you have to wait 20 years to see any effects of your politics. Eh? Um, that is really a long uh, period for politicians, so that's why um, it's, not a, it's not a big topic for them. And I remember 
when I, when I um, said before the structural reform discussion three years ago in the Bologna process, um, one delegate of a, of a larger country said we have to make Bologna sexy again. And he meant sexy for the ministers, uh, that the ministers get involved and are interested. And that's the same issue here. The social dimension is just not sexy enough <laughs> for, the, for the politicians. Um, and then, if I'm right that most of the ministries of uh, only most of all think on the financial student support systems when it comes to the social dimension. Of course, they fear the high cost. Huh? If, if this is the, the, the main issue of social dimension, the financial support, um, and you want to improve it, that means a lot of money. Huh? And, uh, yeah, as we, we heard already in the morning that several countries cut at the cost on higher education, even on student support, so this is a, a big um, issue then. However, uh, if you understand the social dimension a little bit broader, uh, you can uh, start with little and small message, measures um, that are actually quite cheap. Uh, um, what I think is really important is an exchange of experiences. There are so many higher education institutions that implemented little small measures to support this group or that group, um, even maybe small regions that it did something, but they all reinvent the wheel for themselves. Uh, there's hardly any uh, exchange of, the, of experiences and um, even less we have we have a complete lack of uh, measure of impact. What kind of measures really work? What kind of support really really makes a change? Um, and if we know, would know what works, uh, we are lacking to promote these working practices and let the next university uh, reinvent the wheel again. Uh, and of course, it takes time. Then people change. They change their jobs. The knowledge is lost. Uh, and um, stimulated actually by one of these social dimension working groups, um, we coordinated once a project funded by the European Union, which called, we, we called PL4SD, Peer Learning for the Social Dimension, uh, together with ESO, who was a partner at that time in, the, in that project. And we tried to set up a database in the internet and collect, collect all these kind of measures. Uh, but this is not really the perfect, but this is the first step. Um, but it's, it's a dead information. Of course, we had the contact details of all the, those people responsible for the measures. We collected about 300 across all the Bologna states for different target groups of, uh, of students and so on. But uh, if, if you sit in the university and you want to do something, you do not start Googling in databases um, what, is, uh, what is there around already. Uh, um, another issue which I actually have stolen from the, um, from the um, No Future paper, they also re recommend uh, we have to tackle the teacher's education, so teacher for secondary school where the universities are responsible uh, for training them, or new pedagog pedagogical approaches, they all do not cost bloody hell of the money. Yeah? Of course, that does not mean no funding or reform of the financial support system is necessary. But politics, if they want, they could do a lot of other things um, as well to improve the situation. Okay, now about the um, empirical evidences from the from the Eurostudent project. We uh, published the last report um, in spring this year and it contains data from 28 countries. There were about 300,000 students in those countries surveyed. Um, and of course, we tackled the social situation and the international mobility of those students. You see some of the topics in the report, like the characteristic of the population, the socioeconomic background, the transition into higher education, and so on, um, which is in the main report here, uh, the link. We also this time had a special report only looking on the working students, because this is a huge number in many of the, of the countries. And there's an interactive database where you can play around and uh, check for your countries yourself and colleagues of mine will give you uh, in a workshop tomorrow morning kind of an introduction to this um, database and what what is in there what can you find there and how to use it to me one of the most important variables when we 
try to compare the high education systems is actually the age profile. Because from the age of the students, so many other uh, things depend on. Eh? And here's a very um, simple indicator now, the blue part of the of the of the charts um, of the columns uh, shows you the the share of students below the age of 25 and the gray part is the the share of students above 25 uh, and you can see huge differences among the european systems even if it's not completely all the bologna countries but you see that in in uh, iceland we have nearly 60 percent of the students 25 or older and then uh, in in georgia or albania that's about 10 10, 15 percent. So it's a huge difference. Huh? And uh, you, you're all quite young, huh? but in some countries the young student representatives are also the re representatives of a quite old um, student population. And that is probably also um, an, an, an issue. Huh? In Austria, as you can see, we have about 50-50 uh, here. And actually, those share of the older students, I, I um, yeah, show you on the next slide, but can say it here uh, already, they make us look better in all the social dimension statistics eh? because they have a different way of accessing they they come by a second chance routes they drop out early of the school system drop out eh? they go to these vocational tracks actually um, mostly come from disadvantaged backgrounds and later in their life later in the 20s they um, enter higher education so without them if we only would look those students who directly transition from, from secondary school to higher education, eh? the, the student population would be far more homogeneous from very uh, advantaged uh, backgrounds. And this is what we try to measure in this indicator, what we call uh, um, the share of students with the delayed entrance. And delayed we define at least two years after you left the school system. And again, in, in some Nordic countries, that's about 30% of the, of the population. In, here it's about 20, but in other countries it's nearly zero. And um, yeah, this 20% these in Austria, for example, they are on average 27 year old when they enter higher education. So a lot of them are doing their studies, they, they are 30 years and older. And it's very similar in Scandinavian countries and uh, in some other uh, more Nordic countries. Um, these groups, they are not only studying part-time, because in many of those countries we do not even have a system of part-time studying. And uh, that is what the minister said, he wants to um, prefers full-time students, really um, engaged and active studying and so on. But for those people, when you start studying with 27, they have already a job. Huh? It's not about employability in that sense. Huh? But for them, it's really a problem of the, uh, like Hannah said, the combination of work and, uh, and studying and how to manage this. And that's why it's not surprised that they cannot study full-time, even if we do not have a part-time uh, status in, in uh, this country. But they have completely different uh, social background and they of course have um, different uh, problems within the within their studies and in the in the higher education system and in some countries i think that group is really in danger for example here when the introduction of new admission systems and entrance exams and so on it's mostly those mature students that give up very early in the process and do not enroll anymore you could see it in the in england with the high uh, fees when they introduced the high fees the number of part-time students the number of mature students decreased a lot uh, in that sense uh, so in some countries they are really in danger and that would bad for politics uh, at least, worsen our statistics in, in the social uh, dimension. In other countries, they are, uh, they are developing new support systems for those uh, kind of students. Uh, like in Portugal, they have special uh, grants for the students older than 23 year old when you enter the, the system. In other countries as well, 23 seems to be kind of a benchmark uh, to be uh, supported. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, group which I think has a lot of impact on the social composition of the, of the student population. But 
But you can see on the right side there are countries where these groups hardly exist at all. Um, when we compare the social background of the of the students, in this case it's it's only the father, but we have it for the mothers as well. Compare it to the composition in the in society, and that is actually since uh, 15 years or so, it's a goal of the Bologna process that the the students entering and completing very important not only access but also completion and getting a degree. Those uh, students should reflect the the composition of the of the society, and the perfect composition would be along the diagonal. Uh, then um, we would have all. This is measured by education background now of the parents. Then we would have a perfect match between what uh, is the distribution in the population and among the, the, the student population. And as closer a country is to this diagonal, as more equal is the access system uh, and the distribution among students, and as far away to the bottom right corner a country is positioned in this, uh, as uh, larger is the gap. Uh, the only thing here, we debated a lot with our colleagues from Norway, as you can see Norway is quite far away, uh, and in previous reports it was nearly on the line, uh, um, but they swear that they didn't change anything in the question and in the calculation of the indicator, and they believe um, uh, that really there was this big step uh, back uh, since the last three years. Okay, but this is kind of a quantitative measurement of the of the um, social composition of the students. We tried in the last round also to introduce more. Yeah, it's not qualitative because it's a quantitative survey, but more the kind of uh, feeling. So in that um, round, we also asked the students if they feel that they belong into higher education, that they are welcomed in, in higher education. Um, and surprisingly, this didn't work out as expected, that there's a um, correlation between the education background and um, the um, belonging to, the feeling of belonging to higher education. On average, however, you can see that 14% of the students say, we do not feel that we belong uh, to higher education, that we are not welcomed here. In some countries, that goes up to 20-30% of the student population, but mostly it's about 10-15% eh, that feel, do not feel welcomed uh, in high, high education. Uh, and in some countries you have a uh, correlation with the education background of parents, so students from disadvantaged backgrounds feel less welcomed at the, in the universities. In others uh, you don't see these um, differences very strong. So this is another way we had, it's a little bit uh, kind of still experimenting with these kind of uh, issues. We're going to have a workshop on Wednesday together with the uh, uh, people from ESO uh, about discussion about changing the questionnaire and maybe um, we will change these kind of questions um, to get it more on point. But this was a first trial to not only measure the, the quantitative disadvantage but also um, the feeling of the students. Um, gender segregation, that is also an issue. Huh? In most countries, uh, but only two or three countries, I think, in the Bologna process, the majority of students are female. Huh? So most countries say, check, problem is solved. Huh? But actually, by gender, we have a huge segregation um, by subjects in most of the countries. Um, and here you see in the blue um, columns, you see the over-representation of female students in education, which re reaches up to 60%, 60% over-representation, more than the average in the country. Um, and in the gray bar, uh, uh, columns uh, going down, you see the under-representation of female students in ICT subjects. Uh, so in Italy, they are under-represented by 80% compared to the average uh, composition by male female students in the in the country and that's really a huge issue it's uh, of course it's very well known um, engineering ICT and so on we have more male students um, social work pedagogics um, health in some countries we have more female students uh, but therefore the topic is not solved uh, not just because we have the majority uh, of the students are female, we have to look deeper into this. Um, another uh, issue is migration. Migration, um, 
is a little bit, for my impression, is a little bit complicated to measure. Huh? There are international definitions when uh, does a student have a, a migration background or not. But here in some countries, I'm actually not really sure if the students or the, the, the parents of the students moved from one country to another or if in some areas the borders moved and the, the families actually stayed where they lived um, um, for years. However, across all the countries that were able to deliver data on this indicator, we have kind of a perfect match. 10% uh, second uh, generation students um, in the, among the student population and 10% in, in society. But there are other countries. Eh? And now it's not about the, the height of the column, it's the difference between the dark and the light blue uh, column, which is uh, interesting. And therefore, if you look far to the right, we have uh, Finland here with 4% in the population, but only 2% in the student population. So that's an underrepresentation of 100% so to say. Huh? So there are twice as many in the, in the population. You have other countries like Austria, 13 to 8, it's nearly uh, the same, nearly twice as much. We have Estonia, 19 to 12, but we also have other countries where it um, seems to fit uh, better and they, um, students with migration background have less um, issues in accessing and uh, high education and studying. However, what would really be needed here is a breakup of the migration background by the, by the region of origin. Yeah? Because uh, we know that it makes a huge difference where the students and the family comes from. Um, here in Austria, for example, we have a high number of migrants from Germany, which speak the same language and, uh, of course, it's two different countries, two different cultures, uh, but still it's not so difficult to, to get used to the, to the education system than uh, students coming from other uh, countries. So, and that is uh, mostly a lack of, uh, of data on the one hand, on the population data, because also in all the international reports, you, only, you put all these mid migrant background together in, in, uh, and treat them as one homogeneous group, which they definitely not are. Huh? Um, and this is one example where we sometimes even have better data from the students than we have data from the total population in a country. So it's not so easy uh, to measure, measure this. And, and another example would be students with impairments. We have quite good data, but different uh, kinds of impairments. I don't have that slide here uh, today, but we lack this kind of information about the total population in the country. So we cannot say, uh, if blind or uh, whatever um, um, impaired students are uh, over or underrepresented in the higher education system. We only can say that they have a lot of troubles within the systems in most countries, but what about the, the excess and the over or underrepresentation we are lacking in that case? We are lacking data from the total population. Um, some other issues only indirectly related to the social dimension. We ask the students um, to assess their financial situation and you see in the in the dark blue and maybe we can take the light blue together, um, this is the share of the students that say they have severe financial um, problems while studying. And it starts in Georgia with about 40% of the students reporting this. Um, Albania, Slovenia, Poland, but then we also have Iceland, Ireland, Norway, Denmark uh, getting quite close. So it, that is not an issue of being a rich country or a poor country. That's not an issue of being in the west or in the east or in the north or in the south. That is a completely mix of all, of all the countries. In other indicators we can see regional patterns uh, for historic reasons, but not when it comes to the financial situation of students. Uh, that is really uh, uh, completely uh, a mix. You see on the, on the other end for example, you see the Czech Republic, you see Switzerland, you see the Netherlands. Um, it's also East, West, EU, non-EU and, and uh, rich and uh, not so rich countries. Um, and this has to do with the composition of the students' funding. Where do they get their income? And of course, the source of the income also depends on your age. And remember the first slide, uh, if the majority of the students is really in the beginning of the 20s, then it's quite likely that most of the funding comes from the, from the parents or maybe public support, but mostly from the family. 
as older the student population is, as more likely they are self-sustained and get the, get the funding from uh, own income. So, and you see Republic of Serbia, Georgia, uh, Portugal, we have 70, 80 percent of the, of the student income comes from the family. Uh, and on the other side of the, of the list, we have uh, Finland, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, so Scandinavian countries, where only a smaller share comes from the family. And where does it start? It's, I think it's in Poland, where, where Poland is in the middle of the, of the list, uh, to the right, most of those countries, the highest share of the incomes comes already from self-earned income. Uh, in the other countries, it's the family, which is the dominant income source. And then you see the light blue uh, areas, that's the public support. Uh, and that's when all, well, I mentioned before, that all the countries say, yeah, we have student support, financial student support, but you can see that for the students in some countries that's really uh, a relevant amount of money for the for their total income and in other countries that's about 2%, 3% on the average income of a student. So um, it's very easy for the countries to say, yeah, we have it, check, problem solved, but actually no one or nearly no one profits from that system in, in some countries. Um, all right, I have to admit that what is not included here, because we only measure really the, the flow of, of, of money, what is not uh, included here is if the students get a deduction on fees. Uh, um, because that is money they do not pay, so it's not in the, in the flow of money um, in here. Um, and that shows you student support, the recipients versus the importance. That is um, a chart where we try on the X axis to share, show the share of the students that receive any financial support from public sources. Um, and uh, on the Y axis, on, on, the, on the height, we show the share of uh, what share of that amount of uh, grant or loan or whatever it is, uh, is of the total student income. Uh, so you can clearly see that there's uh, a huge spread, a huge difference among the European systems. Again, we have the Scandinavians, a high share of students receive anything, and when they receive anything, it uh, sums up to a high share of the total income of the students. Uh, in other countries, uh, like Georgia, Serbia, Latvia here, uh, only a small share of the students receives anything, and if they receive anything, it only adds 20% of their budget. So there's also huge differences among these um, support systems in, in Europe. Another and the last uh, indication here um, is accommodation. Accommodation is getting... Um, it, in some countries it was always a big issue, but it's getting more and more uh, an issue in most countries as the housing prices are rising a lot since the financial crisis. Um, and of course, on the first thing, this also reflects the age composition of the student population. Uh, if you have a high share of young students, it's more likely that they stay in the parents' house. That's the blue uh, part of the, of the column. Um, as older the students get uh, on average in a country, as less likely they stay with the parents. And of course, if you're a small island like Malta, um, your parents never live far away, so it's also easier uh, to stay with them if you want uh, um, than in a larger country where you probably move to a different city for, for studying and so on. So the, the geographical uh, issue um, doesn't have to be underestimated. However, above on the blue Part, the, the dark gray part is the share in, uh, in student accommodation. So in public housing, mostly subsidized, not always, but mostly subsidized. And you again can see a huge difference among, uh, between the countries. So in some countries, like in Turkey here, uh, more than 40% of the students live in these uh, student accommodations. In Sweden, in Sweden it's uh, 30%. Uh, in Finland, it's 33%. Um, in the Netherlands, it also reaches nearly 30%, and in some other countries, um, we only have yeah, Malta, that's obvious because of the island situation, but in Italy, it's not an island, eh? and we only have 3% in uh, student accommodation, and many countries in between. Eh? And that is an indirect uh, measure of supporting students, and actually, um, this is a measure 
that could be advantages uh, for, for students not being eligible in the usual grant system of a country. Here, for example, it would mean it could be an advantage for students from third countries, from non-EU countries that would not be eligible for an Austrian grant, uh, but they would appreciate uh, living in, an, in a subsidized housing. Uh. And you can see that in Austria we have quite a few only, and in, in Vienna, among the Viennese student population, something like eight or nine percent only living um, in this kind of student housing. So this is also big issue and big differences um, among the countries. All right, to sum up, um, some two remarks on the data. What we should never forget is all the data I showed you now, and different studies, we only have this data about the students, uh, those who are in the systems. Uh, we have no data, at least not on international comparative level, of the potential students, those who wanted to study but didn't make it for whatever reason. Uh, we have no idea who they are, how many, what, whatsoever, what kind of backgrounds. Those who didn't want, but actually one could say they, they have the talent, they could go to university. No idea about them. And then um, in the system, we have, um, we have students that were uh, for a short period in and then dropped out. Uh, there are studies on, on, on dropping out and so on, but uh, we have nothing on international level to compare those. So those are not in the system anymore, so they are not part of all these kind of uh, surveys. So we're only um, seeing here in the data like the top of the, of the iceberg. Second issue, um, whenever you come across on international comparative data about high education, um, this more and more gets confusing. The minister mentioned it in the, in the beginning, um, especially the, the OECD data, for example, which was published two weeks ago, the education at a glance, that for many is kind of the data bible of uh, education policies. Uh, look carefully how they treat the ISCAT 5 levels, that's the short courses. Uh, and short courses in some countries are part of higher education. They are implemented in universities, even a two-year program in a university. Here we count the last two years of the vocational school system as short courses. So it's secondary level uh, and not higher education. And that makes a huge difference because we have a lot of pupils in those kind of schools and that raises um, our data a lot. So another issue is how is the vocational training treated? He mentioned the master craftsman uh, courses, that they are included in some of those statistics and so on. So it does not always mean when it says uh, tertiary education that we really refer to high education and that we speak about uh, universities. And then for these social dimension issues, it makes also a um, um, huge difference what is the share of international students in a country. And here we have about 20% of international students uh, in, in Austria who did not go to school in Austria. We don't um, count them by passport or nationality, that's irrelevant for all these social dimension issues. But where did you go to school? In the country or uh, in a foreign country? Uh, and. Uh, Politics, if you want politicians to convince, to do something, they only can, can do it with their own population. We do not know who will come in 10 years from abroad to study in this country and we cannot set any measures uh, for them. And we know that these international students are to a far higher degree coming from an advanced background. So, in that sense, they also shake up uh, the statistics of those countries with a high share of international uh, students. So, where do we stand? Um, in the comparative data, we have some information from about 30, a little bit more than 30 countries, about some groups of students. Uh, age, the late transition, male-female divides, socioeconomic background, migration, about impairments, students with children. That is something we have, at least for those 30 countries. Of course, we lack the same information from other countries. Uh, and Bologna process, uh, nearly 50, so 
um, some more countries could join this. However, we have completely elect, at least on international level, maybe national it's different, but on international level of other groups, and that we lack from all the countries. Eh? Non-binary gender issues or groups, the sexual orientation, religion, ethnicity, linguistic minorities from some countries. I forgot to add the Roma uh, here, or the traveler populations. Students from rural areas, eh? we are approaching this a little bit. But there are so many other dimensions of the social dimension where we are completely blind, at least on international uh, comparative level. And the next step then would be intersection analysis. Eh? What is if you're a female with my migration background, having a child, maybe having um, an impairment and so on. So that adds on. Uh, it's not different groups, but they can be overlapping groups, and all these characteristics may add on and uh, increase discrimination issues and, and so on. We have not reached, we are working on that, the intersectional thing, uh, but we are not there where we uh, should be. And, as I mentioned, we have nearly no information about the potential students and what kind of barriers really prevent them um, from entering. In the Bologna process, where do we stand? I would say there's only progress if the students push for it. That is, would be my resume for the last 20 years. Without push from ESO, there's no progress in the social dimension. Um, but this push is also, it's not only needed on international level, but also on national level. Uh, students, unions should push the governments to implement those, what actually their ministers decided uh, within the, the Bologna process. And um, I was very happy to see that this week there will be the next Bologna follow-up group meeting and ESO made a proposal for a new social dimension working group and uh, hopefully you succeed and it's not hidden in whatever implementation group and they only uh, have two hours for the next years for this important topic. But uh, even if it only works if the student push, the students were never alone. There were always allies around. Uh, they only do not raise first uh, hand because they might have other priorities, but they admit that social dimension is an important issue. Remember, uh, in this survey among the ministries, social dimension was on, on uh, third position. Uh, so once the students start, there will always be some countries following, joining that groups, and really want to make progress. Uh, uh, some stakeholders, that the teacher representatives were great allies in the past, eh? but also when you, this is less in the Bologna process, but more in the, at the universities, there are so many admin people in quality assurance and whatsoever that want to make a change, that want to make progress. Eh? They are good allies as, uh, as well within the uh, institutions. Eh? And now the, the very recent discussion about lack of talents um, that could bring new uh, allies, but I'm not sure if you really want to have them as an ally, because of course they argue more from, ec from an economic perspective. Uh, we, are, we have a lack of talents, so now we need females in engineering. Now we need those with migration background. Uh, that is the human capital uh, theory. But at the end, if um, you can also look at this very pragmatic. You do not have to agree to their argumentation, but if it helps to get more people from disadvantaged background into the universities, um, yeah, I think that is your, that's your business to decide on these kind of allies. Um, Last slide, what would I think what are to do is we, the researchers, we are perfectly aware to, that we have to improve the data collection. Uh, I mentioned some of the lacks, um, but of course we always depend that somebody uh, is funding this, that someone is willing uh, to support this. The European Union from time to time does it, but also on national level. Um, I think more countries need to collect data and monitor their student population. We have it from about 30, uh, that means that 20 countries are um, lacking and we could really, would really appreciate more pressure from the student unions of those countries to join this kind of uh, project and compare their situation. Um, however, I think to convince the countries really 
to implement what they decide on the Bologna process, we have to win some of the model countries, some that are a little bit ahead, to tell, to tell their stories. Why did, do they do it? Eh? It's not only about financial issues. They see a different purpose in it. Why they invest, why they um, set measures and so on. And we somehow we, ha we have to make these countries talk to convince the others. Eh? Get them back from this, it's only about money uh, issue. Eh? Um, but I don't have the perfect idea on how to make the, the countries to, uh, talk, but it's about the, their narrative, their storytelling to the colleagues from other countries. Um, as I mentioned before, we need to make good or working measures visible. First of all, we need to know what, how to measure and what is a working measure, but if we found one, uh, we should promote this. Um, and maybe for the beginning, especially those with lower costs, to convince the countries that there can be a lot of things done uh, without spending uh, too much money. But we need a better system than we tried years ago with the peel 4 d system. And, uh, all over, we need more exchange of experiences among the policy makers, among the researchers, the students, and the practitioners in, in high education. And um, we, we, we recommend this to the European Union, but also to the member states all the time, that they should set up platforms where people can meet and talk about their experiences in these issues. Um, so, um, to stimulate this kind of uh, exchange of experiences. Thank you very much. Martin Unger, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Please stay with us. We're doing a round of uh, questions for five minutes. I would uh, ask Liam to pass around the microphone. Are there any questions? Hello. Uh, you have mentioned lack of data about students who didn't make it into higher education or who didn't want to on international level. Are you aware of any uh, national research on this topic that could be used as inspiration? Um, I'm aware of that in Germany. They have a, a survey among potential students but I think they only get those who just left the school. They don't get these 27, 30 years old who also would have the right to go into education um, if they want or if they do not want. So it's easier to get the youngsters in school or just after school. Um, I think a few countries do exit surveys from secondary school. But they mostly ask, what are your plans? And that's used for steering. How many places do we need in the future in different uh, systems? But hardly they uh, include questions about the social background or, uh, or whatsoever. Huh? So then, actually, the, um, the best what we have would be the PISA study when they are 15 years old, because there we have some of the data, uh, but it's not sure that all the 15 years really uh, graduate from secondary uh, and not leaving, that, that really depends on the system. If it's a very comprehensive system, it's easier to calculate that. If we have a very diverse school system um, with a lot of vocational tracks, then probably it doesn't work. But you could have the 15 year, the composition of the 15 year old from PISA as an estimator who could be the potential students and compare them uh, on, on who really enters higher education. Uh, I see two more questions, one here, uh, hand raising here in the middle, uh, and another one on the right. First. She was first, please. Hello, hi, I'm Gwyneth, I'm from NUS Wales. Um, you talked earlier about how it's really important to get ahead of the cart kind of with students when they're before they go to university. Do you have any examples of what you think would be the best way to do that, like how to encourage students when they're like in pre-16 education in schools, what the best way is to help them avoid that kind of trajectory and make sure that they get into HE and that they're on like good paths? I'm not, I'm not sure if you got fully the question because the speaker goes in the other direction here. Um, it's about what to do with the... Um, um, actually, 
start in kindergarten. Who goes to kindergarten? Um, who goes to which kindergarten? Is it free? Is it costly? Is it one year? Is it three years uh, kindergarten? And so on. There are studies, mainly from the US, among 40-year-old persons where you can prove effect on their career if they had been to kindergarten or not. Uh, there's a perfect cor correlation. That's really like 35 years later, you can still measure the impact of the, of the kindergarten. Um, but, of course, it's also important what happens in kindergarten. So, and um, kindergarten, that is an, a German word made it into English, but in many other languages um, it has a different meaning. In French it's the école maternelle, so the word school is into in many Scandinavian, it's scola something. I think even in Italian or in, in, in Latin countries you have this word of schooling. We have the word of garden, that's a playground. Uh, that's far away from education. So it's already the language, how, how you name these institutions for the little kids. And that uh, is also probably a difference what really happens. And here happens less education uh, than in the Ecole Maternelle in France, for example. But uh, that only means start as early as possible and then on all levels. And then um, the teacher training is really important. Uh, that they must uh, be aware of the differences in the classroom and um, different cultural backgrounds, um, different social backgrounds, and how to work with them. Yeah. One more question here to the right, yes. I was saying that uh, you had a... Um, um, you were comparing the, the level of education to students' fathers. Um, what happens when we look at the mothers? Do the number, name, uh, numbers change a lot? Or what happens when you look at both parents having a higher education? Say it again. Yeah, sorry. Um, at some point we compared the... We, we were looking at the student population compared with the level of education of their fathers. When you're looking at the mothers, do their numbers change a lot? Or is this the same thing? And what happens when it's both parents, actually? Okay. Um, it's the same trend. The level might be a little bit different, but it's, uh, it's the same trend. Um, usually in all these education issues, you would refer to the mother. Because we know that it's the mother that's doing the homework with the kids, um, preparing for classes, for exams in school, and so on. Um, but here, that is a methodological issue. Eh? We compare one generation to another one. And in the parent generation, they are in an age where mostly the expansion of the higher education system profited uh, the females from. Uh, so if I would use the mothers, I cannot be sure if what I measure is the effect in the parent generation, because more and more of those uh, mothers uh, who are now mothers in, the, in that age started studying, where the males were already there, uh, or if I measure an effect on the students. Uh, and this kind of the, what started in the 70s, 80s, at least in, in, in Western Europe, I think this generation is over now and we could change to the mothers in the future. But the, the difference is very small, actually. And that, that's very small because um, marriage mostly happens on the same uh, level and education is really important for that. Uh, so those who studied uh, marry someone who studied uh, as well. Uh, and between the workers and so on. So that makes the, the, the low social mobility in a, in a society. Thank you very much. Is there another question? Okay. Is there any more questions? Then we'll close the round after this. No. Very good. One more question. Hi, um, my name is Washington, I'm from Ireland, um, and we have a, quite a developed national access plan, but I wanted to pick up on your, the part about um, improving data collection, because that's now the issue that we're kind of starting to look at. Um, and I suppose, what are your thoughts on the barriers to improving that data collection? Um, and what are some of the solutions? Because we're a bit lost on that one. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, sorry, accents. Um, uh, in terms of improving data collection, that's something that we're 
looking at in Ireland. Um, are there any particular barriers or solutions to that? To the, to the early selection? Ah, with the data collection. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, mostly, that I think it's the responsibility of the of the policy makers. So the ministries should do that. In some countries, if the ministry doesn't do it, the student union started it. In Estonia, for example, the first years when Estonia participated in this, it was the student union organizing, in Finland as well, by the way, in the beginning of all these collections. But of course it's a matter of money. Serving is not, is not a cheap issue. Um, and someone has to, to fund it. And I would say that is really a public responsibility to monitor your system, to, to, to see what is happening. Eh? Only then you can do uh, good politics about it. So that would be the ministries, but then it's only one source you have to, to convince, and that could be a hard bone. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin Ong. Uh Ah, that's super. Thank you. I think you provided us with some really important numbers that will serve as an overview for the next three days. And I would like to ask one uh, person on stage who would like to contribute to the collection of data in this field. Her name is Carolina and she will present her project in a short minute. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it really matches with the theme today, I think, because there have been uh, budget cuts in Europe uh, and this actually um, managed that students really have high debt. And we think it's really important to stop this popular thing in Europe that we keep, uh, keep shortening on education. So we want to send in a proposal for uh, research against like the loan schemes uh, and we're looking for partner unions for that. So if you would be interested, I'm here for today and tomorrow morning. So we could just have a chat, have some coffee and talk about it and see if we can work together uh, for this uh, research. And also it doesn't matter if you have a loan scheme or not because it could be really interesting if you don't have one to like compare these with each other. So, thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Now I would like to ask all those who are volunteering for the Österreichische Hochschülerschaft and Hochschülerinnenschaft to come on stage and join me for the picture and also just so you all remember our faces if we guide you somewhere or uh, somewhere else so you can know where to go at one o'clock. Please join me, Sasha, Liam, Marita, Hannah, uh, all those uh, come on stage please. And thank you for all the work you're doing these days, uh, for all your support. This is the ESC team of 2018 here in Vienna. So, um, there they are. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so that was the picture of the volunteers. Remember their faces. And now I have a little surprise for the music lovers in the room. We actually need to clear the room for tw 10 to 20 minutes so the catering can prepare the tables. And now that we are in the house of music, I asked the management of the house if we could have a little tour in these beautiful rooms we have upstairs where you will find a lot about the history of music especially in Austria. So I would kindly ask you to have a little walk around and be back at 12 o'clock, 12 uh, until 1 o'clock for lunch. And then at 1 o'clock, people from ÖH will bring you to the TU where the workshop will start at 1.30. 1.30 at TU, I'll see you there. Have a nice day. Thank you. <laughs>